All right, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn them to Luke chapter 7. We haven't forgotten communion. We're going to do communion at the end of the message today. But take your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. There's um, no kids program today either. So if you've got little kids, um, I know there's some books back there. If you're interested in um, taking one of those books to have a look at with the kids or uh, mums, if you need to use the creche, there's a room right down the corridor, right around in the far corner if you need to use that anytime during the service. But Luke chapter 7 is what we're looking at today. And in particular, you can see there the, the passage verses 36 to 50. And in this passage, there are really three main characters. Jesus, who is uh, obviously the main character of just about every story in the Bible, he's one of them. There's a Pharisee, and there is a prostitute. And it's a story. It's a, it's a narrative. And so I really don't have an outline for you today. We're just going to read through the story, kind of walk our way through the narrative, and then we'll talk about some principles along the way and think about some lessons at the end of this passage the heading in my Bible says, a sinful woman forgiven. And by the way, this is the only time that this story is mentioned in the Gospels. There is another similar story to this one, but it's a, it's a different place, a different occasion, a different time that's mentioned in the other Gospels. And sometimes people get these stories a little bit confused, but this is the only time it's recorded in Scripture. So I'm going to read through it and then explain it as we go. So follow along with me and you can see the verses on the screen. Luke 7 verse 36 says this, one of the Pharisees asked him, that's Jesus, asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Stop there for a minute, because this is like an unusual beginning to a story. We see that there's this Pharisee, and I think most of us remember who the Pharisees were, right? They were religious leaders. They were known for their... um, their commitment to the finer details of the Old Testament law. They were very legalistic. They were very self-righteous. They prided themselves on being righteous in their own eyes. You could say that they were kind of like the morality police of their day. They were quick to point out the faults of everybody else, but they were very slow to see any problems in themselves. And subsequently, these Pharisees thought that they were okay, thought that they were okay with God. They didn't see themselves as sinners, they saw themselves as righteous, and they were very self-deceived because of that, because they weren't true followers of God. They were, you could say, self-righteous sinners. And Jesus has a wonderful knack of exposing their sinfulness, and he's going to do that in this story. Now, these Pharisees, they had a growing suspicion about Jesus. They hated him, in fact. They, they clashed with him all of the time. They didn't trust Jesus. They, they didn't like his teaching. In fact, they were really jealous of his popularity, and they would even scoff at the miracles that he performed. And they hated the fact that Jesus would sometimes associate himself with people like tax collectors and with sinners like this prostitute we're going to see. In their eyes, in the Pharisees' eyes, Jesus was like an outcast. Luke recorded a couple of chapters earlier in Luke chapter 5, verse 21. He said, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this? Talking about Jesus. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And so the Pharisees had already accused Jesus of blasphemy because he claimed to have the power to forgive sins sins. That really upset them. And so it's interesting and it's unusual in some ways that these Pharisees or this Pharisee, his name is Simon, we see that later on in the story in verse 40, that this Pharisee Simon would invite Jesus to come to his house for a meal. And we'd probably just want to ask the question, why is it that this Pharisee, why would Simon even invite Jesus over for a meal? It was so out of character for that kind of thing to happen. Was he trying to be kind and hospitable to Jesus? And I think the answer to that question is no, because as we see, he doesn't show any hospitality at all to Jesus. Perhaps Simon was curious about this Jesus and was trying to find out if Jesus was truly a prophet, because a few verses earlier in chapter 7, the people had said of Jesus that he was a great prophet or a great prophet had arisen among us. 
And so maybe Simon, this Pharisee, was trying to find out for himself, is this Jesus really a prophet? So I'll invite him over to my house and maybe we'll find out. That's a possibility. But to be honest, the most likely reason that Jesus was invited to Simon's house was to try and find some evidence to trap Jesus. Because the Pharisees considered Jesus to be an imposter. They said that he was a a fraud. And it's interesting that Luke even records in chapter 6, verse 7, he says there, the scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely. They watched Jesus closely in order to find a reason to accuse him. And so from the Pharisees' perspective, Jesus was like their enemy. They wanted to catch him. They wanted to accuse him of breaking God's commandments in order to like discredit him and to discredit his growing popularity. They wanted to get rid of him, essentially. And despite all of this, Jesus gets an invitation and he accepts the invitation. And after, after all, you know, Luke does tell us, doesn't he, later on in his gospel in chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus came. Why did he come? He came to seek and save who? The lost. And so these Pharisees were lost, and they too needed the gospel just as much as everybody else. And by the way, Jesus did make it a habit of dining with these questionable people. We do see that he does dine with unpopular tax collectors and sinners. He did that a couple of chapters earlier. Remember, there was that occasion when Matthew, the tax collector, was saved, and there was a great celebration that Jesus went and participated in. And Jesus is actually going to dine with a couple of other Pharisees later on in the book of Luke as well. So anyway, here's Jesus. He arrives at Simon's house for this dinner party. In verse 36, it says, He went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at table, it says. There's somewhere in Galilee, in the northern part of Israel, and I think you understand, right? A first century home is very different to a 21st century house in New Zealand. Jesus would have been walking into a house that would have been probably made of mud bricks. It would have had a a flat roof. It would have had a hard clay floor. Some homes, if they could afford it, would have mats all over the floors. And if it was an evening meal, which I think this possibly was, there probably would have been oil lamps that were lit inside, just providing a little bit of lighting, a little bit of dim lighting. And a custom of the day was that you would wash the guests' feet as they arrived. There were obviously no sports shoes in those days. You know, there was no Nike Airs or Yeezys or Vans or Chucks or whatever we have today. But if you went shopping for shoes in those days, you had one option, and it was to wear sandals, which meant that your feet would get dirty as you walked around the muddy and dusty streets. So every guest would normally arrive, they would have their sandals removed at the door, at the entrance, and they would have their feet washed by a servant of the owner. Now, I'm not sure if foot washing took place on this occasion for any of the other guests, but it certainly didn't happen for Jesus, and we'll see that soon. And it says at this particular meal that Jesus reclined at table, and again, this is not a typical table as we would think of today with chairs around it. In those days, a table was kind of like this, actually, something just on the floor, and people kind of lay around the table. They reclined around the table, on, usually on their left sides, and they would be kind of leaning on their left elbow with their feet pointing away from the table. Sounds pretty uncomfortable, doesn't it? You should try it sometime, but uh, that was how they did it in those days. And then in verse 37, it says, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointments. So here we have an uninvited woman from the city arrives at the Pharisee's house, and she's called a sinner. Literally, one with a reputation for gross immorality. In other words, this woman was devoted to sin, and she was most likely a prostitute. This means she was most unwelcome, a most unwelcome visitor in a Pharisee's house. 
Pharisees despised sinners and prostitutes and certainly tried to keep well clear of them. And it may have been that Simon allowed her to stay because he didn't want to make a scene, some kind of nasty scene with Jesus and the other guests were there. But understand this, for her to arrive in that context at that Pharisee's house would have taken a great deal of courage for her to do that. And the question is, why did this lady show up at Simon's place? She certainly wasn't invited by Simon. He would never invite someone like that to his house. Well, she came for one reason alone. And the reason was, is Jesus was there. She wanted to see Jesus. And although Simon despised the fact that this woman showed up at his place, it was actually culturally acceptable for hangers-on, you could say, to gather at this kind of meal. Uninvited guests would often come to dinner parties in order just to sit around and watch and maybe listen to the conversations that were going on, especially if a rabbi or a teacher had been invited to that dinner. And so these extras would crowd into the house and they would sit around the walls or maybe stand around the walls and watch and listen. Some of them just to hear those conversations and maybe some of them who were perhaps a little poorer came along hoping for some kind of gift, maybe hoping for some food as well. Well, this lady didn't want any leftover food. She didn't come to hear the Pharisees prattle on about how great they were. She came with one purpose in mind, and that was to see Jesus. And we can assume that she had most likely heard Jesus prior to this event. She'd probably witnessed some of his miracles and heard him teach. And she knew that Jesus was different than all other men or most other men in her town, Many men would come to see her with lust in their eyes, but Jesus had love in his heart and concern for her soul. She was probably weary and heavy laden, and Jesus was able to give her rest, as Matthew 11, 28 talks about. And so on this particular occasion, as she quietly entered into Simon's house, it says later on, we'll see in verse 47, that her sins have already been forgiven. Perhaps she had been converted under the ministry of John the Baptist, who had a preaching ministry at the time and was also going around that part of Israel. But anyway, she comes into the house and she stands around the perimeter of the room watching and listening, just waiting for an opportunity to express her love and gratitude to Jesus. And notice what it said there in verse 37, what she brought with her. It says, an alabaster flask of ointments. In other words, it was like a a vial of perfume, just a little small round flask, um, like a circular container with perhaps a long neck that was used to seal the and keep the fragrance in it. And when it was time to use it, the neck would often be broken off and the contents would be poured out. And it's a reasonable assumption for us, I think, to say that this perfume that she had was very expensive. An alabaster vial of perfume may have cost up to a year's wages in that culture and in that time. And obviously she had accumulated enough funds to be able to purchase this perfume, and it would have been something that she no doubt owned as part of her former profession, which says a lot about her former way of life. But look at verse 38, what it says there. It says, and standing behind him, behind Jesus at his feet, Weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with, her, with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And so this woman has made her way into the room and she's standing at Jesus' feet and she begins weeping. And the original word used is the one that speaks of like rain water. And this wasn't just like a tear or two that she had, but it's like she had this continuous outflowing of tears that were coming from her eyes. And these tears were falling onto the feet of Jesus, and Luther, in his commentary, calls her tears heart water, for it was surely coming from her heart, he says, and as she was doing this humble act. 
which incidentally was quite timely because remember Jesus' feet were still dirty. We'll see that later on. And they hadn't been cleaned at the front door. And the question is, why is she weeping? Well, perhaps there is a number of reasons, or perhaps she has mixed emotions at this moment. Perhaps she has sorrow over her sin, and she's perhaps reflecting on her life of immorality as a a prostitute, and so she's weeping about that, her many sins that verse 47 talks about. Maybe at the same time, there's like this emotional joy that she's going through because she has experienced being in the very presence of Jesus, who at this point is now her savior, the one who has now carried her burdens. And so perhaps she has tears of joy. And as she wept, it says there in verse 38, she kept wiping Jesus' feet with the hair of her head. And this is another significant action for this time because a woman, for for a woman to let down her hair in public was culturally unacceptable among the Jews at that time. In fact, typically the only women who did let their hair down in public were prostitutes. And so this woman has no water, and so she uses her tears. She has no towel, and so she uses her hair. And then she begins to kiss the feet of Jesus. And once again, this is a very unusual act. It certainly wasn't PC for those times or in that culture. It was not a normal reaction. And it's not that normal either in our day and age, is it, either? We might, when we have a brand new baby and we give the baby a bath, kiss a baby's feet or something like that, but it's highly unusual for another adult to kiss a person's feet. The grammar actually says here or indicates that she is literally kissing Jesus' feet continuously. I mean, this is kind of a very unusual scene that, people are seeing in this house. She was violating all of the cultural norms of her day. But her actions were evidence of her deep love and appreciation and gratitude for Jesus, her Savior. And what did Simon the Pharisee think of all of this? Well, not only does he have a man in his house that he's trying to incriminate, that he doesn't like, that he hates, but he now has this sinner woman acting very strangely. In fact, notice what she does next. She cleaned Jesus' dirty feet with her tears. She dried them with her hair. She kissed his feet. And now she's pouring expensive perfume on them. She's anointing his feet. Now, it would be perfectly normal at the appropriate time to anoint somebody's head with much cheaper oil, maybe olive oil. But to pour out this expensive perfume onto somebody's feet was an extraordinary act. Now, if you can imagine kind of being there, if, if there was a large crowd of people in Simon's house and perhaps it was the evening and the room was perhaps dimly lit, it, it is possible that the woman's actions so far had gone unnoticed by a number of people in the room. But once she broke open that flask and that perfume has been poured on Jesus' feet, everyone in the room would have been drawn to the, the powerful scent that would have come from that perfume. And so maybe now everybody in that house is looking at this woman. And what do they see? They see a woman giving an amazing love offering. This woman gave Jesus the very best that she had. This wasn't like a $2 bottle of perfume that she was using. She was using the most exclusive, expensive brand that she possibly could. And she didn't really care what other people thought. She was, at this stage, a brand new, on fire follower of Jesus, and not even the presence of those highfalutin Pharisees could stop her showing her love for Jesus. So what is Simon's reaction as he watches all of these bizarre events unfold in his house? Well, it's kind of like he starts having this little conversation with himself in his head, in his mind. Look at verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Simon didn't speak out loud. He was really just only thinking to himself. 
And it's like he attacks Jesus in his mind. He accuses Jesus in many ways of being ignorant of the situation and of this woman. He's thinking to himself, how can this man, Jesus, be a prophet? Because if he was a prophet, a true prophet, he would run a mile from this woman. He certainly wouldn't let her touch him as that would make him morally and ceremonially unclean under Jewish law. And so I can imagine that Simon the Pharisee was getting a little bit agitated. He was highly offended in the first place that this woman had come into his house, and then he starts attacking Jesus in his mind because he thinks Jesus is oblivious to what really is going on. And so Simon concludes that Jesus is not a prophet, and Jesus, and he concludes that Jesus has no idea who or what sort of woman this was that was touching him. And look at verse 40. It's interesting. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And he answered, Simon answered, say it, teacher. Think about that verse. Jesus answers Simon, but Simon didn't actually say anything out loud. I mean, here is the deity of Christ in action. Luke is portraying to us the omniscience of Jesus. Jesus knows everything. He can read minds. He knows the thoughts of this Pharisee just as he knows all about this woman. And let me remind all of us, Jesus knows our thoughts and he knows who and what kind of person you are and I am as well. There is no hiding from God. Now, what did Jesus say to Simon? Verse 40, Simon, I have something to say to you. Perhaps Simon thought Jesus was going to pay him a compliment or perhaps even give him a word of wisdom. So Simon sort of says to Jesus, well, say it, teacher, maybe sarcastically. Tell me something profound, teacher. I'm all ears. I'm listening. Simon has no idea what's about to unfold. In verses 41 and 42, Jesus tells this wonderful little parable Verse 41 says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? I mean, it's a great story, isn't it, of debt that has been canceled, that's been forgiven. Both of these people had huge debts that they couldn't pay. I mean, one One denarii in that culture was somewhat equivalent to one day's pay. So 500 denarii was kind of close to two years' wages. And 50 denarii was something like about 20, or or, sorry, two months' wages. But it's like the banker shows grace. He removes the debt from both of their records. I mean, it's a a wonderful story, right, if it was a true story. Pretty simple to, to understand, isn't it, how this unfolds. In today's terms, I guess we could think of it like this. Um, Lewis and Angus are sitting right here in front of me. If Lewis had a mortgage and it was $500,000, right, and he couldn't pay it, and Angus had a mortgage, let's just say it's a smaller one, $5,000, and he couldn't pay it, and the bank called up both of these guys and said, hey guys, don't worry, I've canceled your mortgage. It's all paying off, paid off. Your debt is gone. You don't owe anything any more money to the bank, it's done. Now, who's going to have the most gratitude and love for the bank? The one with the greater debt, right? The one with the biggest debt. And so Simon answers it rightly. Look at verse 43. Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you've judged rightly. Because great love comes from great forgiveness. The greater the forgiveness, the greater the love. And you'll notice perhaps there's an air of arrogance even in Simon's response. He kind of says, I suppose, maybe that's somewhat sarcastic as well. He could have just said, hey, the one whom was forgiven more just said it like that. But whatever Simon's attitude was, if it was wrong or whatever, Jesus affirmed that he said the right answer. You've, You've judged correctly, Jesus said. You've got it right. And at this point, maybe Simon is feeling, you know, pretty good about himself and about his answer, and he has no idea, really, that Jesus is about to turn this whole thing upside down on him. 
because the application of the parable really comes in a moment here. Because Jesus, you notice what he does next. He looks at the woman and he talks to Simon. With his eyes turned towards her, Jesus asks the Pharisee to look at her as well. And Jesus applies the parable by way of simple contrast in verse 44 and following. It says, then, then turning toward the woman, Jesus said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. It's a... It's really a a setup to to show the miserable position that Simon the Pharisee is still in. He's still trapped in his sin, and it's evident because of his lack of love. And ironically, the so-called sinning woman is no longer trapped in her sin. Simon has been a poor host. He hadn't shown the simple courtesies expected of one who invited someone over for a meal. Simon the Pharisee gave no water for Jesus' feet. The woman, the sinner, gave heart water, her tears. Simon gave no kiss of greeting. She hadn't stopped kissing Jesus' feet. Simon gave no oil, not even cheap oil, olive oil for Jesus' head, but she anointed Jesus' feet with costly perfume. As you look at it, by comparison, who was in the better position? It was the woman. She loved much. Simon showed no love. She is forgiven, but Simon is not forgiven. And there's a lot of irony, really, in the story. At the beginning, the woman is perceived to be the sinner, but at the end, Simon is still trapped in his sins. And Simon's lack of love proved that he had not been forgiven. So Jesus proved to Simon that he knew all along the details of this woman's past. Look at verse 47. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. I can imagine that Simon wasn't feeling too good at this point. Maybe he probably wanted to kick Jesus out of his house. Perhaps he was embarrassed in front of his friends. Perhaps, and friends, perhaps he was feeling a little bit humiliated. Sadly, he wasn't convicted about his own sin. He was still his self-righteous, arrogant self. And as I said earlier, for, verse 47 confirms that this woman was already saved when she walked into the house. The the tense of the grammar here, the verb here, talks about an action that had already taken place in the past. She had been forgiven, and she remains in that state for all eternity. It's a beautiful picture, that terminology, someone who has been forgiven. Now, the woman's love, just as a footnote here, the woman's love for Jesus was a consequence of her salvation. It's not, it wasn't the cause of her salvation. Remember, salvation is always by faith alone, not by works. But Jesus affirmed her salvation in verse 48 when he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But we know, don't we, that salvation is by faith alone. It's not because of her acts of love and acts of service that saved her. That was the demonstration that her heart had already been forgiven. And as always, whenever Jesus interacted with the Pharisees, they questioned his power and they questioned his authority. And it's no different here if you look at verse 49. Then those who were at the table with him, probably a bunch of other Pharisees, began to say amongst themselves, who is this? Who is this guy? Who even forgives sins? It reminds me of the story in Mark chapter 2. Remember the, the story of where the guy came down through the roof and Jesus healed him, but also forgave his sins. And it says there that only God can forgive sins. 
And so these Pharisees who didn't believe that Jesus was God, they, they disputed the deity of Christ. They doubted his ability to forgive, and ultimately they accused him of blasphemy, which is unbelievable, really, in that context. And so they rejected Jesus. And as a result of rejecting Jesus, they turned their back on their only hope of salvation and the only hope of forgiveness that they could experience. And then Jesus has one more final word of encouragement for this lady, for this woman in verse 50. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. I mean, imagine being there in that occasion at that time, just sort of watching that whole episode unfold. Be an interesting experience, wouldn't it? But there's some lessons that we even need to think about a little bit more in this passage. Luke, as he writes the gospel of Luke, has a purpose in writing it. And part of his purpose is for us to understand, first and foremost, who Jesus is. That's what the gospels are all about. Who is Jesus? So what do we learn about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And I think we learn the big picture of this story is that Jesus has the power to transform the life of of any sinner. That's one of the main points of all of the Gospels, that Jesus can change lives. He has the power to radically change people's lives. He also knows all things, right? Even the thoughts of man. He knows, as I said earlier, who each of us are and what our lives are like. Jesus knows all about us and who we are. And we learn from this passage too that Jesus forgives sins. That means he must be God. And he takes upon himself the debt of our sin, which is implied by this passage as well. And right at the end, that he is the giver of peace. How do you have peace? How can Jesus say, your faith has saved you, go in peace? The only way that you can have peace is if your sins have been forgiven and you're a follower of Christ. But the passage reminds us too that God forgives our debt, does he not? That we had a huge debt. And yet God forgave it all if we're a follower of Christ, our sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west. Our debt has been fully paid, every little part of it. As we go through a passage like this, we ought to even be asking ourselves, do I want to have a deeper love for Jesus? And I hope you do. I guess that's why you're here today. And I'm sure as a follower of Christ, we all should have that desire. How, how, and the question is, how can I have a greater love for Jesus? Well, I think one of the answers to that question is have a greater understanding of our sin and what it is like. Because then and only then will we truly find out how great our Savior is. If we understand how sin has impacted our lives, if we have a healthy understanding of sin, both before we were saved and still the impact of sin in our life now, it will have a huge impact on our relationship with Christ. Remember the Apostle Paul, after he was converted to Christ and became a follower of Christ, he could say, I am the chief of what? Sinners. We know he had a pretty rough life before he came to Christ. He was approving of people killing Christians But even after he became a Christian and after his sins were forgiven, Paul still recognized that sin impacted his life and he could say, I am the chief of sinners. Romans 3.23 says, we all fall short of what? God's glory, God's standard. We all fall short. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. You've committed enough sins to fall short of God's standard and God's glory. And I think oftentimes a lot of people like to compare themselves to others to make ourselves look better. But we don't want to do that. That's what the Pharisees did. They kind of looked at other sinners and their minds to make themselves look righteous, but we shouldn't do that. You don't look over at somebody who's a criminal and say, I'm not a criminal, I'm not as bad as that person, or I'm not a gangster, or I'm not a swindler, or an adulterer, or a rapist, or whatever. We don't compare ourselves to other people We all must compare ourselves to Christ and to God's holiness. And when we see ourselves in view of God's holiness, we will then get a true reflection of what we're like, that we fall short of God's standards, that we're still sinners and we're still impacted by sin because the greater we understand sin, the greater we will see Jesus to be. The knowledge of our sin fuels our love for God. You could say it that way. 
We know that Jesus is a great Savior when we fully understand that we're a great sinner. When we recognize and realize that we are a great sinner, then and only then will we recognize we have a great Savior. How great or small is your love for Jesus? And really, it's proportionate to understanding our sin in our lives. And so we need to ask ourselves these questions. How, how is my love for Christ? Is it large or is it small? Is it medium? We need to reflect on those things. And oftentimes, our love for Christ is proportionate to our gratitude as well and our thankfulness. As we understand what Christ has done for us, our love for Christ will be growing as we have a grateful heart and a thankful heart. And so as Christians, we need to be grateful for what Christ has done for us, that he stood in our place, that he's taken the, the punishment of the wrath of God in our place. And when we recognize all that Christ has done for us, it should well up in us a, a greater love for him and a greater appreciation for him and a, and a greater desire to thank him for what he's done for us. John Owen said this, he said, the man that understands the evil of his own heart, how vile it is, is the only useful, fruitful, and solidly believing and obedient person. In other words, he's just saying we need to understand, you know, how far short we fall of God's standard and God's glory. But thankfully, we can run to Christ who is a great Savior, and we can express our love and obedience to him because of what he's done for us. We're going to sort of transition at this time, and we're going to celebrate communion, and I thought it'd be nice to have it just at the end of this message because it really is an opportunity for us to reflect again on all that Christ has d done for us and the, the forgiveness that we have as believers. As I said, God's forgiven us. Our sin is cast as far as the east is from the west. There's other metaphors in the Bible as well that remind us that, that our sin, God takes it and he casts it behind his back so that he doesn't see it and he, and he throws it to the depths of the ocean and we're certainly grateful for that, that he forgives us. And so great forgiveness should result in great love and also great obedience and also gratitude and thankfulness and as we think of what Christ has done for us, the price that he paid. And so let's bow our heads. I'm going to give thanks um, for communion and just thank the Lord for this message. And then um, I'll just mention what's going to happen. Father, we are grateful that you love us and you loved us so much that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to, to die in our place, to be our substitute, to be our redeemer to be the one who would make it possible to have a right relationship with you. and Lord, we know that our sins are totally forgiven and you have cast them as far as the east is from the west, but Lord, we know that those sinful tendencies still hang on to this earthly body and they still trip us up. And Lord, we, we remind ourselves of that and it just, again, magnifies in our mind how gracious you are and how forgiving you are to continue to, on a daily basis, forgive us. But Lord, ultimately, we're thankful that you have forgiven us fully and that our future is not in danger because you have totally forgiven us. But Lord, we recognize that from day to day, we, we trip and we stumble and we need to still confess those sins. And, and Lord, that hinders our relationship with you now, but it doesn't take away our eternity. And so, Lord, help us to, to live in light of these truths. Lord, help us to be growing in our love for you and in our gratitude. And Lord, at this time, we just want to say thank you for your love to us and for your forgiveness of each of our sins. And so, Lord, as we take this communion now, we want to say thank you for the bread, which demonstrates that your son, your perfect son, laid down his life for us. He shed his blood. His body was broken for us. It was beaten. It was bruised. Your wrath was upon it. And Lord, we're thankful for that. And we say thank you, Jesus, for standing in our place. And the, and the grape juice, Lord, reminds us again of the blood that was shed, the life that was given in our place. And so, Lord, thank you for these things. Lord, may our love for you grow deeper and stronger because of all that you have done for us for all of the blessings that we enjoy as Christians. So, 
Lord, bless this time now, even as we celebrate, we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to just